Bonnie, thanks so much for coming. I think that I'm just kicking this off and Bonnie will tell me if I'm wrong in that. And um, I appreciate the, the time and attention that um, everyone um, throughout this community is giving to this conversation we're gonna have with medical professionals here in our city um, and really appreciate that we have um, the three directors, medical directors of our healthcare systems here with us today to answer some questions and share with the community and what's happening right now and what they're seeing. I want to um, start this off um, with a couple comments. Our goal today is to share the information that some that we believe the community needs to have and to encourage you to take steps to get vaccinated as soon as possible if you're able to, to protect those who can't and to protect our ability to continue um, with business, with community and all those things that we care about, to recognize that what's happening right now um, is something that's gotta be paid attention to, but there are easy steps that can be taken um, to end this tough time that we've all had. So to do that, I wanna first start um, and thank not only the doctors that have joined us today, um, but the healthcare professionals um, that are once again finding themselves in a situation they hoped never to see again. Um, this has gone on now since the beginning of 2020. Um, we owe so much to those who have taken care of us, done everything they can to keep people safe and healthy. Um, they thought, um, as did so many of us, um, that as vaccines came, that we would get beyond this. And now they're finding themselves in the same situation they were in before. Um, and it's tough. It's tough on so many, but tough particularly on those um, who've given their lives to saving our lives. And they're seeing easy steps that we can take and, and we're not all taking them. And so I implore you to think about that. So thank you to all of our healthcare professionals um, that are out there day by night, toiling to keep us healthy and safe um, and seeing things they thought they'd never have to see again. Um, I really deeply believe that we owe it to our kids, um, our community's kids, um, to our family and neighbors, to our coworkers, to the businesses throughout the city, um, to get vaccinated. It is safe, it is effective. It is the single most effective thing that you can do to ensure that we get beyond this and that we protect the life um, of those who can't be vaccinated and, and the kids in particular that can't yet. Thank you to everyone that took that step as soon as they could. And to all of you in the last week that have decided to jump in, head to the doctor's office and ask for, ask for your vaccination. As an employer, we're doing what I'll encourage all employers to do, and that is requiring masks in our buildings. And we're doing it to protect our employees and their families. We're doing it to protect the public who comes into our facilities. And importantly, we're taking care of the kids that are in our care at camps and other times. We see that as the role that we and other employers throughout the city and state, frankly, need to take right now. Um, and with that, I wanna introduce the three doctors that are with us today. They're going to um, have some statements of their own, share some information, and then I have some questions um, that I'll ask. They're questions that we've heard people in the community are asking, um, and they're questions that these doctors um, and all of the healthcare professionals that they represent want to make sure that you, as residents, are having answered so that you've got the information you need to take the step that we all need to take together. And with that, um, first I want to say we have Dr. David P Peterman. He's the CEO of Primary Health. We have Dr. Jim Souza, the Chief Medical Director at St. Luke's, and Dr. Patrice Burgess, the Chief Medical, the Executive Medical Director, excuse me, at St. Al's. Um, these three hospital systems have worked side by side with the city and then others in the last year and a half as we've had to make decisions to protect the health of our residents, which has always been our number one priority. And I am so grateful that they're willing to be with us here today um, and to share with all of you so much of the information that they share with me and others as we're trying to navigate these tough times and protect everyone. And with that, I'm gonna ask Dr. Peterman from Primary Health to set the stage, share some data with the public and what you were all seeing. He collects a lot of it and we've all talked about it all. Um, and then from there, um, I'm gonna ask both um, Dr. Souza and Dr. Burgess to let us know what they're seeing in, in their own hospital systems right now. So with that, Dr. Peterman, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And, and I appreciate that everyone is trying to get the facts out so all of our cities, citizens and community members can make good decisions to keep everyone healthy. 
Um, this is one of those occasions where I actually took some notes because I want to make sure that I share with the public uh, the facts as we have them. Uh, throughout the pandemic, primary health, uh, just by the basis of what we do, have seen a very large volume of patients who've been evaluated for coronavirus and, and tested and also treated. Um, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if I should say unfortunately or fortunately, primary health has been able to predict uh, in about a three to four week uh, advance period, the surges that we've been, been in. If we accept certainly what has been said that we're now in the fourth surge in terms of the United States, <clears throat> we at Primary Health started seeing an uptick of COVID positivity tests about four weeks ago. And to give you a sense of where we are, we are right now, uh, as, of, as of today, um, the number of positive tests uh, that we're seeing daily are comparable to what we saw in, in January. Uh, the positivity rate of the tests we're doing now are 20, at 20%, which again is consistent with what we saw in January. You may recall that the recommendations by the CDC and, and all the experts is you want the positivity rate for the test to be 5% or lower. So we're four times that rate. Um, the number of people actually being tested in our clinics, uh, requesting tests, has tripled. Again, these numbers are um, comparable to January and December. The majority of those uh, patients that are requesting a test are, are symptomatic. Uh, we also look at our data in terms of age ranges. Every age range has at least a double or triple increase. Uh, most concerning is, is in the five to 12 year olds there's a triple increase in the positivity rate and also an increase in the number of positives. Also, there's an increase of, uh, of the positive rate uh, in the 12 to 18 year olds and all the rest of the age groups. Uh, I was just relaying to Dr. Souza on Monday in our urgent care clinics, and albeit we now have more clinics than we used to have, uh, we, we had the second most urgent care visits in our clinics on Monday that we've had in the whole history uh, of the company. And then finally, uh, here in Ada County, uh, currently the case rate, which is based on a seven day average per 100,000 is 20, which again puts us in that higher range. We were down around the four to six range back in, in June. So. Again, all of those numbers are going in the wrong direction uh, and um, comparable to what we saw in January and December. Thanks, Dr. <laughs> the Dr. Souza. Yeah. Great. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Um, I, I think uh, where we stand at, at St. Luke's, uh, interested to hear from my colleagues at St. Al's, is we're, we're kind of entering the class five rapids of this pandemic. Um, and what I mean by that is for us to get through and achieve our objective, which hasn't changed, it's to preserve hospital capacity for care. Just like when you try to navigate a class five rapids, we all got to work together. Um, Every war, you know, every single rower has got to put their oar in the water at the same time, and the right and the left sides of the boat got to work in tandem. In terms of why I say that, uh, it, it's because of what we're seeing right now. We went into this surge in a challenging situation. We were um, already seeing these unprecedented summer volumes, multiple diagnoses, as we've already shared with the media a couple weeks ago. Um, and those were related to relaxation of protective standards, like, you know, we're even seeing more RSV uh, lately, as well as increases in just pent up demand and probably suboptimally managed chronic care from the first three surges. Now, on top of that, things are changing really rapidly. Um, when Dr. Peterman and Dr. Nemerson and I met with the media just two weeks ago, at that time, I shared we had about 40 
uh, patients admitted with COVID across our system. That was about 10% of our adult beds. Right now, as we speak, we have 78 patients admitted across the system with COVID. So we've doubled in two weeks. 19 of those folks are in critical care locations. Um, more than 95% of these are unvaccinated, consistent with the data recently reported by the state of Idaho. And our average age is now down to 59 years. Now, I wanna make a point on this number. 79 patients might not sound like a lot, but please recognize what that means. It means that 15 to 20% of our entire adult bed capacity is occupied by one diagnosis and one that's growing rapidly. And if you put that on top of the already strained situation we had, you can immediately start seeing the problem. What it means on the ground is that we're needing to board patients in our emergency departments now for prolonged periods of time. As we speak, I just checked this before the call, we have nine patients right now boarding in our EDs waiting for beds. This includes one ICU patient, Last week, we had a child that was supposed to go to the pediatric intensive care unit who had their entire stay provided in the emergency department due to no beds. Um, now, you know, our ED doctors and nurses are amazing and they're also not ICU nurses or doctors. So this is impacting quality of care because care is being delivered in a different way. Um, I'd, I'd like to make an appeal to the public to, to help us, to help them um, by working together on this. We're gonna do our part in, in healthcare. You're gonna hear that from all of us, I think today. Uh, if, in terms of our hospital systems, we're constantly adjusting our staffing. Our hospital operators are like Jenga masters at, at matching the people with the patients. They're really good at it. And we're also beginning right now to plan uh, what and when we're gonna be pulling back on elective care. Um, our people have continued to step up and take on more. So we're gonna do our part, but we need to engage the public now to do its part. So if you haven't done so already, my, my appeal like the mayor's is to please get a vaccine today. Um, this will make it, this will make it so that you won't be one of our hospital statistics in the near future. It's also gonna help us preserve capacity for care. It won't help us this week, but it might help us in three or four. The other thing though, that we can all do right now is follow, because we did it before and it worked before, is follow the guidelines that if you're indoors with people who aren't your family, mask up. That can actually help with this problem, potentially as quickly as seven to 10 days, given the, the shortened incubation period of this uh, Delta variant. So that'd be my appeal, Mayor, and thank you for having us. Thanks, Dr. Souza. Um, you know, I might have some questions for all of you in addition to what we discussed afterwards, just based on some of your comments. Um, I did have one for you, and that was, you know, you brought up that there are more people, and I'm, I'm not a doctor, so this was my, my layman's here of it. There are more people that your um, healthcare professionals are seeing because of, I think it was like lap, lapse of safety and precautions, et cetera. Is that like where my family, for the last year and a half hasn't had a common cold or anything for that matter because um, and normally I would be sick my daughter would be sick we'd have these winter things going on is that what you mean where so many of us didn't get sick and now we're sick for because we're out and about and so people yeah. are coming in for care is that what the increased number of people that you're seeing beyond what you normally would see in a summer pre-covid means Yes, I mean, uh, just like uh, social distancing and masking and great hand hygiene and, and those sorts of precautions have helped prevent the spread of COVID. They've also helped prevent the spread of other uh, infectious diseases, including respiratory viruses. Um, okay. So yeah, it, we, we've seen upticks in, in that activity probably related to the same relaxation of those standards. Okay, great. Thanks for cl um, clearing that up. All right, and Dr. Burgess, I'm sorry I said your name the wrong way the first time. I, I apologize nope. for that. Thanks no worries. For, it's my husband's thanks. name, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> I think about it when people say McLean instead of McLean. Um, it's my husband's name. You're not messing mine up. Um, That's right. Thanks for being um, here with us. And I'd we'd love to have everyone hear what's happening at St. Al's. 
Yeah, pretty similar. You know, numbers are slightly different. Our test positivity rate is, you know, primary health, I think, sees a broader um, uh, group of people. So ours has gone up from about 4% to 17%. So still a dramatic increase, but not exactly the same numbers. And our COVID patients are about 6% of our hospital beds right now. So not quite as high as St. Luke's, but still uh, used to be about 1% or even 0.1% even a few weeks ago. I think the sad thing is we were so close to having the, the community spread drop down into a, a more safe range where we could really uh, legitimately relax some of our precautions. And that has changed in the last four weeks. We've tripled our incidence in the community. And so all of the things that you're hearing about masking and vaccination are even more critical because we're in this very delicate stage where variants really of the virus take off when they can find a uh, a host that is not that is susceptible, so not vaccinated. And then the more the virus spreads, the more it mutates. So we were so close to being able to tamp that down. And now we're back in a very vulnerable stage again. So the other thing I wanted to kind of highlight, uh, in addition, uh, kind of what Dr. Sousa said, but just highlight that is our hospitals have become very busy for all the reasons he said. But one of the things he mentioned uh, briefly is we had pent up demand because we were really ramped down for quite some time. And so once we were able to open up a little bit, we had people that needed surgeries or that had uh, diabetes or heart disease or other things that weren't managed as well because they were not able to come in for care. And now all of those things are peaking. So we're very, very busy with regular care. And then COVID is starting to peak again. And the other thing I would add is we're, we're a pretty exhausted healthcare workforce. You know, as you mentioned, I appreciate your comments. We have frontline workers that have been pulling extra shifts and wearing full PPE for prolonged periods of time, sometimes working outdoors to test patients and, and uh, do all kinds of things that have been challenging for about a year and a half. And just when it's kind of makes me think, I've never run a marathon, but it makes me think about you know, coming to the finish line and then seeing another hill. And that's, I think, how a lot of our healthcare workers are feeling. So we really do need the community's help uh, to keep themselves safe and also preserve our capacity. And we uh, are fortunate now that we do have supply of vaccine at the very beginning I chaired the governor's task force. We had to figure out who got to go first. And that was a really horrible place to be, but we prioritized our 65 and overpopulation, I think did a good job with that. Now we're in the, in the fortunate position of really having vaccine for anybody that wants one. And, that, and that's a wonderful thing because we, we didn't have that at the beginning. And I will also echo just in concluding that our ICU is now, uh, the patients in the ICU with COVID are younger, they're sicker, and they're unvaccinated. And so we really wanna do everything we can to keep that from happening. We have people in their thirties uh, on ventilators and we just were not seeing that at the beginning, but we are seeing that now, which I suspect is partly due to the Delta variant. Thank you. Um, we have time for two questions. Um, so now I have to choose which two we have, we're gonna ask. But all of you touched on something that you're seeing the people that are in the hospital are, are primarily unvaccinated. And, but we're also, as, as a vaccinated person, you know, I'm hearing about breakthrough cases. Um, some of the, the test results have been shared and the number of people that have been vaccinated um, with COVID. I'm wondering if you could shed some light on that. And I, I know Dr. Peterman has said, mentioned too that people being tested are showing symptoms, so perhaps um, you know there is it looks higher breakthrough case wise, um, but you know there's some questions there about well I got a vaccination and now should I be worried? What steps should I take? You know how do I navigate this? And recognizing that we are learning every day new things about this virus, which is an uncomfortable place for anybody to be in. So th thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so this morning before this call, I spoke with uh, Dr. Kathy Turner, who is the state epidemiologist. Uh, her latest information is that the those cases that are typed, 83% in Idaho are Delta. It is probably a higher number. So that's the disease we're dealing with right now. Um, uh, actually, uh, I think what we all need to understand is unfortunately, Delta is a very different virus than what we dealt with in December. There's no question, it's incredibly more infectious. And there certainly seems to be data, particularly in England, that it's, that it's more uh, virulent. 
And, and just to get an understanding, I think it's worth just taking a minute here about testing. When, when you do a PCR test, you're essentially measuring the amount of DNA of that, of that virus. And we looked at 35 patients that had been vaccinated that were positive. And you can look at the amount of, of DNA that's there. It's what's called the viral load. And if you have a lot of it, it means you have a huge amount of virus. And if there's very little, then you don't have very much virus. Of those 35 patients we looked at, over 80% had a very, very large amount of virus. What I would describe as huge. It, it, and, and why is that significant? It tells this even with vaccination, you can not only get this virus, but you will carry a large amount, which means you are incredibly uh, infectious. Now there are two parts to that story. The first part is, is yes, the, vac the vaccine is not 100%, but, but no vaccine is 100%. And you're five to eight times more likely to get infected if you're not vaccinated. But here's what we absolutely do know. If you're vaccinated, your chances of being admitted to the hospital are very, very small, maybe less than 3% and your chances of dying even more remote. So I've given you, Mayor, a long answer, but I think it's very important the public understand here, number one, vaccines worth. Number two, what we're dealing with today in this Delta virus is very scary for all three of us uh, and, 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 and our staffs. And uh, both uh, Pat and Jim, absolutely said it so well, we really need the community's help here. Number one, of course, I would want everyone who's eligible to be vaccinated. But along with that, we need to wear masks indoors. Bottom line, final answer. Um, they, there is data after data all across the world that masks work. Specifically in primary health, it was incredible how little spread of virus occurred in our clinics because I was wearing a mask, the staff were wearing a mask, and the patients were wearing a mask. So uh, the, the two or three take homes, one, this Delta virus is very, very serious, very contagious. Number two, please get vaccinated. And number three, please wear your mask, particularly uh, indoors. Thank you. Um, and on that, the, I appreciate the clarification because there's a lot of questions about that. Um, and so it's the, and especially at the end, those three points, incredibly important to recognize that um, while we're learning more, we wanna make sure that people are masked um, so that the virus doesn't spread, but that as a vaccinated person, the likelihood of being really, really sick in the hospital and dying or having your loved one dies goes down so much. Um, and on that, you know, kids that are under 12 can't get vaccinated right now. So will you talk to us? You know, we saw last night, the Boise School District took the step to require masks in the K through 12 classroom and anyone in the buildings, um, which as a mom, I'm thinking about the start of school. And I've heard from so many parents in the last couple of weeks, their concerns about the start of school. Um, I appreciate the step that they took. And, and so I'm wondering if you'd weigh in on um, the step that they took, how, what steps as parents we ought to be taking to protect our kids that aren't vaccinated, or as Boiseans to protect uh, other Boiseans, young, young Boiseans who can't be vaccinated? Yeah, uh, I'll be brief so the other two physicians have a chance to respond. Um, I don't know if the media knows I'm a pediatrician, um, but in any event, uh, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC have made very clear recommendations that are uh, predominantly relate to schools. And that is, uh, number one, absolutely every child uh, two years and older that's in a school or daycare should be wearing a mask. Uh, so uh, again, uh, if I'm wearing a mask, you're wearing a mask, we're, we're both uh, protected. Second, um, you would want the layering mitigation steps that have been recommended by the CDC. So again, uh, if it's possible, you would want your children in a room that's ventilated. 
Um, and three, certainly when it's possible, you would like all the staff uh, to be vaccinated. Um, and let again, um, let's make sure that the public understands children 12 and older are eligible for the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, literally millions of doses have been given around the world and, and it's uh, extremely safe. Um, one other thing I would say about children, which is there's some comfort for parents, which is, and many of us are wrong, including myself, which is um, it, this past year, particularly in schools in the, in the United States, it was shown in uh, case uh, uh, ages five through 12, essentially elementary schools, that these children were <laughs> incredibly obedient. Uh, when they were told to wear masks, they wear masks. And when they wore masks, distanced, and when possible had ventilation, um, there was very little spread within schools. Uh, again, I was someone who was very concerned that there would be. And part of what we found was it seems that that age ch child is less, less likely to spread uh, uh, the virus. So the parents can take some comfort. And I would just end, I'm sure all of us would agree, our first priority with kids is they need to be in school. And if we would follow these mitigation efforts, I'm gonna keep saying it, if, if more people were vaccinated, if we wear masks indoors, our kids can safely return to school. Thank you. And I wanna give Drs. Burgess and Susan a chance to weigh in on that or share with us um, as we wrap up, anything else you wanna make sure that the community hears today? I just wanted to mention one thing, if, if it's okay, that uh, that we haven't really touched on is um, obviously our biggest thing is preserving um, everyone's health <laughs> and the hospital capacity to take care of all the things that we need to take care of. But there are also long-term effects from COVID for folks that maybe aren't sick enough to be in the ICU, uh, don't die from the disease, but, but have long-term effects. And some of those are as mild as maybe an alteration in your taste and smell. I've had a patient that had seven months of not being able to taste and smell, which sounds like no big deal, but it's a big quality of life issue, but also much more serious things like shortness of breath, heart problems, blood clots, fatigue, many things that really do affect people's ability to have a day-to-day -day good quality of life, to work in the capacity that they normally would work. So we're not only talking about the most serious effects, but we're also talking about these other long-term effects and the same mitigation measures that we've been talking about, vaccination, masking, uh, hand sanitizing, all of those things prevent a person from getting those long-term effects as well. Not a lot to add. I, I think the Boise School District's uh, decision was courageous and I applaud it on that topic. Um, agree with Dr. Peterman's comments. I, I'd ask the public as they consider their vaccine uh, decision, you know, to understand, of course, vaccines have side effects. N none of the physicians on this call would uh, say otherwise, but, but really, um, try to move from the emotional space where, where a lot of us seem to have been trapped in this vaccine debate to a more cognitive one and, and ask and answer the question, are you more likely to be healthy, not hospitalized, alive with no long-term symptoms with a vaccine in your arm or with COVID in your body? And, and, and when you do that compare and contrast, no matter how you slice it or dice it, the answer consistently comes down, the vaccine is your best bet. It's frankly all of our best bet. And it's the most important thing we can all do together to make this the last surge that we see. Um, and then last appeal from me, in the meantime, given the capacity constraints we have, the vaccines aren't gonna help us for weeks. If we could all find religion around wearing face masks indoors for the next few weeks, we can, we can actually make an impact on our healthcare system's capacity for care. And I'll jump in there. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. I know you're all very busy. 
at your respective hospitals and workplaces, but I would like to give some time for some of the media members on the call to ask some live questions. So first I will toss it over to Kyle Land with the Idaho Statesman. Uh, thank you. Um, this is addressed to all the health officials that are here right now, um, whoever wants to answer this, but I want to know if in your professional opinions that if it's necessary for governments to implement mask mandates, vaccine mandates to help curb this current virus surge that we're seeing. Uh, okay, nobody's jumping in. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, um, it's been a patchwork uh, uh, of uh, leadership. You know, Mayor McLean took a, a courageous stance uh, early on. Um, we saw those courageous stances um, elsewhere. Um, I, I committed though quite a while ago to quit asking for uh, mask mandates um, because I just felt like I was um, uh, shouting into a hurricane. So instead, I'm, I'm asking the public directly to take care of your neighbors, take care of one another, help us help you preserve the capacity for care, and for a short period of time, do what we know has worked. It's worked before, over and over. It's worked in our facilities. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll dovetail onto that. If you look at other countries, uh, you, you can really see some examples of some fairly aggressive uh, mandates, uh, depending on which country you look at, but also success uh, in uh, tamping down the spread of the virus. Uh, we, we hope that people will do the right thing and, and the, the mandate issue has become very political and it is very courageous of those that have uh, been able to do that, but um, hopefully people will just do the right thing. Thank you. Next up, Margaret Carmel with Boise Dev. Hi, Mayor, doctors. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, as this surge comes up, I think there's been a lot of just a lack of information for what vaccinated people should do. Are we in a situation where once again, vaccinated people should stop eating in restaurants, getting on planes, doing those sorts of things, or is that still safe? What is your guidance there? Uh, I, I'll go, um, I'll, I'll respond to that. So there, there are national guidelines uh, and they're the CDC and, and, and they do, uh, they have been changing them, um, maybe changing too frequently, which has been confusing to the public at times. Um, uh, I, I think we could, uh, well, I think the three of us are pretty clear. If, if you are going to a restaurant uh, particularly if you're unvaccinated, but absolutely if you're if you are if you're unvaccinated. But either way, you should be wearing a mask. Um, and uh, in a situation where uh, you could be in a building for an extended period of time and very close, and numerous people are not wearing masks, depending on your age, depending uh, you know what's going on at that uh, venue. And, and depending on that particular individual's vulnerabilities, uh, they I certainly as a physician, I would, I would recommend caution. I, I don't think it makes sense to make blanket statements of you shouldn't fly in a plane or you shouldn't eat at a restaurant. It somewhat gets to what Jim was talking about. Um, I think all three of us would agree that what the mayor did was courageous and we supported it. And if there are other leaders that take those kind of stands, we will support it. But more importantly than, than the rules is explaining to the public that the logical thing to do here to protect yourself, your family, your community, your parents, your grandparents, your kids, wear masks, uh, get vaccinated um, and, and, and try to be safe. Yeah, I'd only add to that and stay tuned. This situation remains very dynamic as it was just proved to all of us. You know, we let our, we let our guard down. We allowed ourselves the opportunity to get hopeful that we had maybe seen the end and then here we are again. And like Dr. Burgess says, it's like the finish line just moved out five miles. It's, it's a real bummer. 
But we'll get through this. We, we will get through this surge, especially if we all work together. And, um, and when we do, we're going to see those numbers come down and stay tuned. These guidelines will change. That's, that's something I've, I've tried to make sure I, I cast when I'm talking about this. We, sh we, we just don't have the luxury of being able to say everything's set in stone and what we say today is going to be what we say literally 10 days from now. 10 days from now, we might be ringing an even louder alarm bell. Frankly, if the trends don't change, we will be. And we have one more question from Kyle before we wrap up. Thank you. Um, it's my understanding that Idaho lags behind other states in terms of testing samples for the Delta variant. I'm just curious if any of you know why that might be, that we just don't have as many of those samples. Uh, I know a little bit, I'm not the expert on it, but um, the, the other thing I think to, to kind of overshadow that the answer with is it doesn't change how we treat the patient, at least so far, you know, um, probably the, the most frustrating, uh, challenging thing about this is we are learning as, you know, continuing to learn and things continue to change. But at this point, we're still using the same treatments. So the test is more of an academic uh, curiosity as far as tracking spread, but it's not changing how we treat people. And our state is looking at uh, in expanding their ability to sequence. So Dr. Peterman mentioned to you, you can tell the viral load with certain types of tests, but to get whether it's a Delta variant or another variant, you have to do what's called genetic sequencing. And that's only done by uh, certain types of machines. And right now we do a certain percentage of samples or if we have a suspicion, but we're not doing widespread sequencing. And I think they're just working on expanding their capacity to do that. I know the VA is helping as well. Great, and with that, I think we're gonna wrap up. Um, I really appreciate the three of you joining us today, sharing what you're seeing. Um, but most importantly, in people terms, what it is that we can do, um, what the, those of us who are vaccinated need to do and talk with my kids about it because it's frustrating because they're vaccinated too. And it is, yes, put the mask back on. Um, let's all be safe and make sure that grandma and grandpa don't get um, COVID, you know, because you don't want them to get it, even though it, from a, um, or kids that aren't vaccinated. Um, if you're not vaccinated, you can take that single step. And across from City Hall next week at the Egyptian Theater, they're having vaccination clinics all day, I think nine or 10 to three o'clock. Um, and you can, I think that you can see that online. As a city, we've had vaccine clinics at libraries and we're gonna continue to have pop-ups. St. Al's, I know you've done a great job with your vaccine van all over the place, um, as has St. Luke's um, and of course, primary health. And so we're, we are asking all of you to take that step. Um, and I'll end it, I was thinking about Dr. Souza's point about you know, reading the river and rowing together. And, you know, the rivers change and you read it the best you can. You do what you need to do. If somebody doesn't row with you, it really messes up the rapids. Um, and then you get to the next one, you got to read it might be different than it was the last time around. So we are learning um, as we go along. We are collecting as much data as possible to be able to share that information. But most importantly, um, we do know the fundamental basics and that is get a vaccine, please wear a mask indoors, um, do everything you can um, to keep that distance, but we can live a life um, that we all enjoy if we take these steps. Um, but most importantly, the simplest one and most effective one right now is to head out and get your vaccination if you hadn't. And so with that, I deeply am grateful to the three of you and your teams and teams of people around the state um, that are working endlessly so hard um, to save people's lives and sharing your message with us today. So please extend our thanks here at the City of Boise to your teams. Um, and for everybody that tuned in, really appreciate that you're here. Um, feel free always to reach out. We'll get you the information as soon as we can. Um, and we wanna be helpful, especially in terms of making it as easy as possible for each of you that hasn't to head out and get vaccinated as soon as you can. Thank you all very much for joining. Bye everybody.